Chapter 13, Homecoming, Thursday, May 5th, 1910. Will and Melinda were happily married now and had two girls, nine-year-old Hattie and six-year-old Olive. The girls were tall like their father and both of them were very beautiful. Every year the family would go for a week-long visit at the home of Will's sister Parthena and his brother-in-law Henry W. on their farm in Puce. Melinda loved going to the Elmstead Pew Settlement because it reminded her of the community her family came from in Kentucky. Hey, Daddy, are you taking us fishing with our cousins like we always do? The girls asked. Yes, I know you children really enjoy that, Will said. While they would sit on the bank of the Puce River waiting for the fish to bite, he liked to make up stories to tell them, just like Uncle Jim would do when Will was young. His sister had nine children now, four boys and five girls, and every one of them were special to Will. When they arrived at the farm, his sister's two youngest children, Frank and Myrtle, ran out to the gate to greet them. Hi, Auntie May May, Uncle Will and Cousins Hattie and Olive, they said. Are we going fishing this week? Frank asked. Frank was the eighth child and was nine years old, the same age as Hattie. He was always asking questions, and Will knew that with everything he learned, he would grow up to be a good storyteller. The youngest child, six-year-old Myrtle, who was the same age as Olive, jumped up into her uncle's arms and began kissing both of them over and over. Uncle Will and Auntie May May, I missed you. She called Melinda Auntie May May because when she first started talking, Myrtle couldn't say her name. The entire Walls family now called Melinda Auntie May May. Myrtle was a sweet little girl, always so polite, and it was obvious that Myrtle was one of Melinda's favorites. They went into the house with Myrtle holding her cousin Olive's hand as they skipped ahead. The rest of them followed with Frank leading the way. In the kitchen helping their mother prepare a big dinner for their family were the four oldest girls, Lydia, Eva, Gertrude, and Jessie. Hi, Auntie May May and Uncle. Hi, Cousins Hattie and Olive, the sisters said as they came and gave each of them a hug. Hello, girls. Hi, sis. It's so good to see you, Uncle Will said. Where's Henry W.? He's out in the machinery shed with the boys making repairs on the corn sheller. He said to tell you to come out there once you arrived, Parthena said. I'll take you, Uncle Will, Frank said as he took one of Will's hands in both of his and began pulling him out the door. Melinda smiled, then turned and put on an apron to help repair the food. Henry W. and Parthena had one of the finest farms in the county of Essex. People would come from as far away as Detroit to see this unique self-sufficient farm. Henry W. had designed and laid out the building so everything was convenient. Attached to the two-story machinery shed there was a smokehouse for curing meat and next to that building a tobacco dryer. Next to this there was another two-story building with an implement shed on the first floor and a tobacco loft on the second floor. Henry's father, John Freeman, had come from North Carolina, and he was one of the first to introduce tobacco in this area. Behind this row of buildings were the chicken coop and an apple orchard. Across the courtyard there were more buildings, including an ice loft for storing ice that was harvested during the winter. Underneath was a root cellar which was dug into the ground where they kept their fruits, vegetables, and preserved meat, milk, and anything else they needed to keep cool. The corn crib was next with a granary beside it that included an open shed and a drive shed for parking the wagons when they were not being used. Behind these buildings were rows and rows of grapes, the vegetable garden, beehives, and more apple trees. Henry was becoming famous for his apples, just like his father, John Freeman Walls, had been. At the end of the courtyard was a huge red barn with a ramp leading up to the hayloft, while the lower barn was where all the animals stayed. A path led to the back of the barn past the pond to the pig pen and the barnyard. The back fields which stretched for acres were behind the barn and this was where a lot of the crops were grown. Near the house they had a garage, a couple of wells for drawing water, another garden, a milk house, more beehives, and some mulberry trees. When coming to the house from the road you had to travel down a long gated driveway which was lined with more apple trees and fields on each side. Their home was a large two-story house designed in the style of homes in England and North Carolina. 
The influence of his parents, John Freeman and Jane King Walls, who had come from North Carolina, was obvious in all the buildings on Henry and Parthena's farm. When Will came to visit, he liked to sit on the front porch with Henry W. They would watch the birds come to feed and roost on the big mulberry tree in the yard while they talked. Daddy! Daddy! Uncle Will is here! Frank shouted as they neared the machinery shed. Inside the shed, Will found Henry working with his other sons, John, Joseph, and Hardy. Henry W. had named his oldest son, John, after his father, John Freeman, who had died last year. His mother, Jane King, was very sad after her husband was gone, and she passed away not long after from what some say was a broken heart. John Freeman lived to be 96, and Jane was 88, so Henry W. felt at least they had an opportunity to live long, happy, and productive lives. Will's nephews came over and shook his hand. Hello, uncle, they said. Hello, boys. Hello, Henry. Parthena tells me there's a problem with your corn sheller. Is there anything I can do to help? Will asked. This hand crank here which drives the wheel had broken. Without it, when you put the ear of corn in the sheller, you can't turn the gears that pull the corn down and rotate it to strip off the kernels, Henry W. explained. We've almost got it fixed. We just need to tighten a couple of more bolts. Do you three boys mind finishing up while Frank and I show your Uncle Will the new foal our horse Betty had last week? Henry W. asked his sons. No problem, Dad, Harding said. You're going to love Betty's new baby, Uncle Will. Will followed Henry W. and Frank out of the machinery shed, then down the courtyard to the lower level of the big red barn. Inside, the pungent smell of manure filled Will's nostrils. It was a smell he was quite familiar with since he grew up on a farm. This was one of the reasons he liked to come and visit his sister because their farm reminded him of when he was young and lived on the Perry farms. Once his eyes became accustomed to the light, he was able to catch up to Henry W. and his son at the last stall near the back. There she is, Henry W. said proudly, pointing to a beautiful little dark brown colt standing next to his mother, Betty. What a perfect little fella. Have you picked a name for him yet? Will asked. Mommy and me have named him Flick, Frank said proudly. What a very nice name, Will said smiling as he put an arm around Frank's shoulders. The two men continued talking as they looked into the stall at the mother with her baby. Their conversation was suddenly interrupted by the dinner bell. We better get up to the house. Parthena and the girls have been preparing a feast all day for you, Auntie May May, and your girls. I know she wants us to enjoy it while it's hot, Henry W. said as the three of them left the barn. The next morning, bright and early, Will went around waking up all the children. Get up, you sleepyheads. It's time to go fishing. He didn't have to tell them twice. They looked forward to their fishing trips because it was always so much fun. Even the older children still wanted to go. Within the hour, Will and the eleven children were walking hand in hand through the fields to the banks of the Puce River with their fishing poles tied to their backs. When they reached the river, they quickly put their fishing lines in the water, stuck their poles in the ground, and then sat around to wait for their uncle to begin telling them a story. Will sat down by a big tree, leaned back, and began. Once upon a time, not very long ago, there was a happy old lady who lived in a log cabin on top of a very high hill. She had a kitten named Cat and a puppy named Dog, and she would take them on their leash for a walk every day. In the valley at the bottom of the hill was the village of Grumpyville, which was full of grumpy people. If it was rainy outside, they would be grumpy because it was too rainy and wet. If it was sunny outside, they would be grumpy because it was too sunny and hot. If it was cloudy outside, they would be grumpy because they didn't know if it would rain or if the clouds would go away and it would be sunny. Fortunately, the children in Grumpyville were always happy like the happy old lady who lived on top of the very high hill. The happy old lady would come to the village once a month to buy food and she would always bring cat and dog with her. The children loved to play with them because the animals were so friendly and happy. Cat loved it when the children would scratch her head and she would purr and purr. Dog would always bring his ball so he could play catch and he would run and run. This was the only time the children got to play in Grumpyville so they looked forward to the monthly visit of the happy old lady. 
The children all moved closer as Will continued because they didn't want to miss any of the new story he had made up for them. An hour later when he had finished, little Myrtle raised her hand and asked, You said the grown-ups weren't grumpy anymore, but what happened to the happy old lady and the happy little children? They lived happily ever after, of course, Uncle Will said laughing as Myrtle and the other children joined in. Can you tell us again about the time you fell in the Puce River and Uncle Matthew and Uncle Young Jim saved you? Frank asked. They had heard the story many times before, but they never got tired of hearing it. Okay, Uncle Will said, as he began to tell them about his first day at the Elmstead Pew Settlement School. So taking his children and nieces and nephews fishing and telling stories was how Will would always spend one of his days when he came to visit his sister Parthena and brother-in-law Henry W. Will had become a master bricklayer, and during the next few years he worked all over Michigan. It was demanding and very hard work, but he enjoyed every day. For the past several years he worked at the Clipper Brick Company in Dearborn, Michigan, but he was 60 now, and carrying the bricks and concrete blocks became harder and harder. When he would come home at night, Melinda would have a hot bath waiting for him. One day, as he lay in the tub and Melinda was massaging his aching muscles, she asked, Do you think you should look for an easier job, Will? I really enjoy being a bricklayer. I doubt there is anything else I would like to do, he said, even though he had to admit that his body was sore from the work. She never answered him, but continued rubbing his muscles. Secretly, she prayed there was something she could say that would change his mind. The answer to her prayers came sooner than she thought but in a way she did not expect, nor want. It was just before Christmas, and Will and another worker were on a scaffold laying bricks when all of a sudden Will began gasping for breath. He started passing out, but fortunately he fell on the boards of the scaffold and not to the ground. His co-worker immediately began yelling for help. When Will finally opened his eyes, the first person he saw was Melinda. Where, where am I? What? What happened? he asked weakly. You're in the hospital, darling. You had a mild heart attack. The doctor said it wasn't serious. You just need bed rest, and after a few weeks you should be okay, she said with a look of concern in her eyes. The two talked a little longer, and then Melinda left so her husband could get some sleep. While lying there, Will began thinking about his past. He knew that his present physical condition would not allow him to do those things now, but he had the memories. He also realized his bricklaying career was over and he would have to figure out what he would do next. He didn't know what it would be, but he knew like his past experiences, it would probably be interesting. That was his last thought as he drifted off to sleep. 